and welcome to Myth Monsters. My name is Erin and I'll be your host for these little snack bite sized podcasts on folklore and mythical monsters from around the world. These podcasts focus on the actual cryptids, folklore and mythic monsters from global mythology rather than focusing on the full stories of heroes and their big adventures. I'll also be dropping in some references that they have to recent culture and where you can see these represented in modern day content so that you can learn more and get as obsessed as I am about these absolute legends of the mythological world. This week, we're veering away from our sweet little bunny from last week with the moon rabbit and onto a much darker monster from slightly across the pond in China, in Japan. Thankfully, I'd just like to say I have recovered from my cold. Thank you for all the well wishes. I feel much, much better and sound much, much better. So I do apologise for the sound quality of last episode. I felt awful. Anyway, we are looking at possibly one of the best and most iconic monsters from Japanese myth this week, and it's the Oni. Oni are generally depicted as ogre-like monsters who come in a variety of different colours, like red, blue, sometimes green or yellow, and no, we're not talking about Shrek here. They have gross sharp claws, wild long hair, and two horns emerging from their noggins. They tend to have extra toes, eyes, fingers or limbs, but generally look quite human bar the crazy colours. They are considered giants and are ravenous enough to cause trouble and eat anything in their path. They're very strong and can sometimes even be intelligent enough to learn magic and become mages and sorcerers. However, most of them, the large majority, are quite stupid, much like a traditional ogre or giant within folklore. But they are considered demons and would punish anyone who went to hell or managed to find them in the wilderness. Which, let's be honest, is probably like being in hell too if you bump into one of these in the night. They're also predominantly male, had a love of cannibalism, and generally are considered to be pretty damn evil. Now thankfully, they did have enough brain power to wear something to cover their nasty bits, and would wear loincloths made from the most ferocious beasts, usually tigers or lions from other bits of mythology. And they would also wield an iron club, known as the Kanabo. Once they had this bat, they would be considered invincible and extremely strong, leading to actually an expression kicking off in Japan, which is Oni with an iron club. So you would say, mate, you're acting like an Oni with an iron club, like proper, meaning you were probably acting a bit invincible and probably a bit stupid, much like most English gentlemen when they get a bit too drunk at football games. Another weapon they would wield is actually the ability to manipulate humans. They are able to shapeshift from one form to another, although they very much prefer their monstrous body. They would transform into beautiful women or men and gain the trust of their victims before taking them back to their lair, where they would generally eat them whole. So what makes an Oni? Oni are actually technically a product of the idea of reincarnation, as Japan is considered a mostly Buddhist country. This is kind of important. It is believed that when an evil person dies, they get transported to the Buddhist hell and turned into Oni to torment the other souls for eternity. Buddhist hell is ruled over by the great Lord Enma, who uses the Oni as their minions to deliver the hellish punishment to humans. They are used as the generals of hell, and would often be the highest up in the roster of demons managing over the legions of hellish creatures in this terrible place. They would generally be used to skin, break bones, or cannibalise live people, and these were humans who had died, but had not been evil enough to come back as Oni, just a little bit bad, I suppose. So how would they get into the human world if they're demons from hell? Well, if a human is terrible enough before they've died, they can actually be transformed into an Oni like a curse for being bad. These are the ones that we know of that are rich in folklore and how we've come to know of their existence, and really are of the most threat to people. However, noted, is there a way to kill an Oni? Not really! I hate to break it to you, but there's not really a way. However, during the Setsbun festival in spring, people will throw out soybeans out their windows with the phrase Oni wasoto fuku wa uchi, which means only go out, blessings come in. So that's really your only hope, unless you're really strong. Sorry, really sorry about that. On to my favourite topic though, and you know it if you've been listening for a while, it's etymology. 
And actually this week we've got one because we didn't last week. Only literally means to hide or conceal, as their original MO as monsters were to hide and jump out on their prey, as they could also in some myths be considered invisible or have the ability to shapeshift, which we talked about earlier. Therefore, in Chinese language, the word only means ghost, implying that they are some formless monster designed to deceive, kill and eat. Although this isn't very specific, I found this monster goes back all the way to the Japanese medieval times from 1165 to 1603 and made its way into art, culture and realistically folklore and myth in the early modern period, which is 1550 to 1850 AD. This is important because of the way Oni is linked to culture in a really fascinating way, as it's also linked to another country. Now, amazingly, in Chinese culture, we're going to talk about this right now, even though it's a Japanese monster, the Chinese culture, they believe in the ways of yin and yang, which most people are aware of. This means that also within this kind of belief, there is the belief that the northeast direction on a compass is called Kimon, meaning demon gate, and is considered incredibly unlucky and generally had evil spirits pass through them. So you can imagine that anyone who goes by this belief believes that the northeastern direction is pretty bad. How does this relate to the Oni, I hear you say? Well, this is because in the Chinese zodiac calendar, if you go in a northeastern direction from a centre point, you will land between the ox and the tiger. Now, you're probably thinking, Erin, that still makes no sense in regards to the Oni. Well, if you think of them now, with its sharp claws and stealth like the tiger, and the huge bovine-style horns like the ox, it's a really cool visual representation from actually a completely separate culture. Now, this kind of links, obviously, back to the Japanese, because they both worship kind of the same religion. They're part of the Buddhist kind of collective. So it's very much, there's a bit of Chinese, bit of Japanese, but there's no actual hardcore Japanese base for this myth. It is just considered a Japanese monster based on the books it came from and where it was generally talked about. However, there's another really cool fact about the Kimon, which is that northeasterly direction, the Demon Gate. So temples in China are all built facing the northeastern direction so as to act as protection against those evil spirits. And buildings in Japan have an L-shaped indentation and Oni-shaped roof tiles called Onigarawa, which act like gargoyles built into the buildings to keep Oni away. You can also keep them away by using holly, the plant, not just a random girl called holly, just saying. Monkey statues as well, because the word for leaving in Japanese is saru, which also means monkey. But all things considered, they've changed a lot in more modern times, and they're generally considered to be more of a protective spirit, with people in costumes, dressed as onis, attending festivals to ward away bad luck, and again these roof tiles to scare away other spirits too. There's actually a really great and famous story about two Onis, but I want you to get your hankies ready because I actually found this one really sad. And also, if you do want to watch a visual representation of this rather than just my lovely Essex voice, you can find some really beautiful videos and animations on this online as well. So the story goes that a red Oni tries to become friends with a bunch of humans, and so much so he makes tea and sweets in his house for them. However, Oni are known for being monsters, and so everyone ran away from him, which really upset the Oni. Eventually, he asks his friend, who's a blue Oni, for help, and asks him what he can do to let the humans know that he just wants to be friends. So the blue Oni comes up with a plan, that he would pretend to be an evil Oni and attack the village, and the red Oni could come in and save the humans by defeating him. So they decide to go ahead with the plan, and it all works. The Red Oni is considered amazing and heroic, they all love him. But then the Red Oni realises that the Blue Oni now cannot go into the village and be friends with them too. So he shortly finds that the Blue One has left, leaving him a note saying that he will stay away so that the Red Oni can be friends with them. The story actually ends with the Red Oni crying for having lost his old friend. And this is actually what the story is called, it's called The Red Oni Who Cried. I'll be honest, I watched an animation on this one and it made me very upset. It was very much like sad, 
really sad videos from childhood kind of vibes. It was completely silent and just very sad. I'll see if I can find the video somewhere and credit it, but it was just beautiful. My sister actually told me about this one, so it was it was an emotional journey for me. And I hope you enjoyed that little story too. But lastly, just to kind of end the origin part, a really fun modern fact is that children in Japan play a game called Ni, which means hidden oni, and it's like tag or it, and the person who is it, so to say, is an oni, which I think is a very cute way to kind of incorporate folklore into modern stuff, and especially modern games with kids, where they can grow up and understand what they're actually talking about in their own mythos, which is awesome. But we're going to move on to cultural significance now on that lovely note for this week. We have a lovely couple of pieces of art this week, such as Sesen Doji offering his life to an ogre from 1764. I'm afraid there's no artist credited here. And that's the same with Oni in Pilgrim's Clothing from the Edo period, which was 1603 till 1867. There's also Oni by Toriyama Seiken from 1779, and as always, some really good independent stuff too. I've actually been using an artist called Matthew Meyer's work this week for my advertisement, so if you've seen that and liked it, that's some really good stuff if you want to have a look at that and support his work. We've only really got a few films for this week. We've got the legendary Studio Ghibli, Spirited Away, Oni Gamaden, Shogun Warriors, The Demon, and Oni. For TV and anime, we have One Piece, Kamisama Haji Mashita, Inu Yashaya, Aya No Exorcist, Demon Slayer, Teen Wolf, Ultraman Ace, Super Sentai, Kamen Rider, Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z, Jackie Chan Adventures making a comeback in the podcast, Samurai Jack and Hellboy Sword of Storms. For video games, we actually have a load, such as Ark Knights, To Who Project, Dead by Daylight, Wizard 101, Ao Oni, Legend of Zelda, Mortal Kombat, Guild Wars, Fire Emblem, Mega Man, Niho, Smite, Yokai Watch, Tomb Raider, Street Fighter, Sonic Lost World, and Muramasa the Demon Blade. And that's just to name a few. You can go and have a look at how many there are, it's insane. My book recommendation this week are actually the same as some of my other Japanese creature episodes and I'm going to suggest the wonderful yokai series by Hiroka Yoda including Yokai Attack, the Japanese Monster Survival Guide and Yurai Attack, the Japanese Ghost Survival Guide. They are fantastic books, it's where I get most of my Japanese mythology information from when I research these so I really do recommend them if you're interested in ghosts and ghouls from this mythos. Japanese mythos is one of my favourites, it's so unbelievably detailed and incredibly artistic and illustrated so I always highly recommend looking into these ones. Now it's time for Do I Think They Existed? Honestly I'm gonna say it's a no from me this time, I'm so sorry. However these are featured in so many modern cultural things that it kind of makes sense that these are so prevalent in Japanese folklore study. That also makes sense in regards to how often they're seen in artwork and within statues in Japan. They're also considered to be quite common so it makes sense with how popular they are to have a bigger following of I believe this. So there's this too. But my only reasonable explanation is that people used to wear masks and commit evil deeds and attempt to blame them on a supernatural being. However, I'm not a detective, so I'm not 100% sure. I wish things sometimes were as simple as a yes or no, but I wish sometimes that Shrek were a real life thing, and he's an ogre too, so get out of my swamp, as they would say in Jilok. <laughs> Anyway, I think that's a pretty cool monster, to be honest, and as I said, one of the more famous ones too. It was a really great one to cover, and a real contrast in regards to our monster last week, who was super, super cute, but, you know, gotta spice things up from time to time, keep all you lovely monster fans interested, rather than our lovely cutesy rabbit fans. Next week, we've got our holiday special. How exciting! I've really been looking forward to this one with my family's Germanic roots. We're going to be looking at the legendary Christmas demon, the Krampus. Now, as I said previously, this is going to be our last episode before the holidays, so we'll be back after this on the 6th of January. But find out if you're on the naughty or nice list this year, next Thursday. 
For now, thank you so much for listening. It's been an absolute pleasure as always. If you enjoyed this podcast, please give it a rating on the service you're listening on. I've got the Twitter for any questions or suggestions on what monsters to cover next, and I'd really love to hear from you. The social media handles for TikTok and Instagram are Myth Monsters Podcast, and the Twitter is Myth Monsters Pod. But all of our content can always be found at mythmonsters.co.uk. You can also find us on Good Pods and Patreon if you want to help me fund the podcast. If you feel like it, help your gal out. But come join the fun, share this with your pals, and they might love me as much as you do, who knows. But for now, stay spooky, and I'll see you later, babes. <laughs>